questions. Great, thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers, uh, Manas, Jonathan, and Aditi, who I guess couldn't be here, uh, for their perseverance in making this program happen. I know it's a couple years late because of things definitely outside of your control. Very glad that it did happen and, and really glad to be here. I think it's my third time here at ICTS. It's always a pleasure and uh, I hope to be back again. Uh, yeah, so the title of this talk, Driven Dissipative Quantum Systems in Hidden Time Reversal. I'm gonna give you hopefully a gentle introduction to uh, a line of research in my group that's been going on for a few years, where we're trying to get exact descriptions of driven dissipative quantum systems. And so the systems of interest are, I think by any measure complicated. So these are systems where interactions or nonlinearity could be large. The driving and dissipation are not necessarily weak. There's not an obvious small parameter in these systems. And often they're in a many body limit. So we have many, many degrees of freedom interacting with one another. Okay, and we like to sort of say things about these systems without making the usual approximations we love as theorists. And the way we're going to sort of address this seemingly very difficult challenge is to make use of a symmetry that at first glance seems to really have no relevance. So I'm gonna tell you about a kind of slightly strange version of time reversal symmetry that's relevant to sort of driven dissipative systems. We call it hidden time reversal symmetry. You could think of it as a particular formulation of detailed balance for a quantum system. So I'll give you a flavor of what that symmetry is and how it enables these, uh, in my mind, these kind of remarkable exact solutions. And then with the time that's left, I'll actually use these solutions to sort of extract some physics. I'll tell you about some results we've, uh, we've obtained recently on a kind of driven dissipative Bose-Hubbard model um, and a very recent, some results on the driven dissipative transverse shieldizing model. And just to start, let me acknowledge the people who really did the work. Most of what I'll tell you is the PhD work of a student in my group, David Roberts, who's on the verge of graduating. In terms of formulating this idea of quantum detailed balance, another student, Andrew Lingenfelter, also made really important contributions. Okay, so let me start with a big picture motivation. Let's get rid of this. There we go, thank you. So big picture motivation, here is a theorist uh, version really sort of reduced to its essentials of a driven dissipative quantum system. We have our quantum system, this gray circle, it has some Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian could be complicated already, many interacting degrees of freedom. We drive the system in some way, maybe that comes in the form of the Hamiltonian being explicitly time dependent. Maybe it comes in the form of terms in the Hamiltonian that add and remove particles coherently. And then we kind of balance that uh, driving, that inputting of energy with dissipation in some form. So one very natural question we could ask is we have this interesting mix of, of different ingredients. What is the ultimate steady state of the system? So the reduced density matrix that describes my system degrees of freedom at long times, what form will it take? So generically, it's not gonna be a thermal equilibrium state. What can we say about it? When does it have interesting quantum properties? Can we use that non-equilibrium steady state as some sort of resource? And more importantly, can we actually describe this infinite time steady state without making any of these usual approximations? Okay, so again, that seems like a tall order. We know in uh, closed systems, right, without driving and dissipation, there's a whole set of seemingly strongly interacting systems where we can make exact statements. This is the whole field of integrable quantum systems, beta ansatz techniques, right? One could try to use beta ansatz techniques, apply them to sort of open quantum systems, and there's a whole interesting line of work in that direction. What I'm gonna tell you about is distinct. It's a different sort of theoretical approach to sort of make exact statements on this kind of system. Okay, so let's make things a little bit more concrete, right? Let's consider, in a sense, one of the simplest kind of driven dissipatives, in this case, just classical systems you could think about. And again, we're gonna have a periodic drive. So let's just take a harmonic oscillator, position X. Let's give some nonlinearity to the oscillator. Here's the nonlinear non duffing spring constant. And let's parametrically drive it. So let's modulate its spring constant at a frequency omega two that's close to twice its natural resonance frequency. Okay, so this simple parametric oscillator has all sorts of interesting physics. 
It has a, a breaking of time translation symmetry. We have this nice kind of uh, pitchfork bifurcation. So for weak drives, again, just classically, the zero oscillation amplitude state is stable. If we drive strongly enough, we have this bifurcation. We have two finite amplitude solutions that emerge. Same magnitude of the oscillations, but they differ by pi. Okay, so to, on top of that sort of basic physics, we could imagine adding dissipation, so some damping, that's this gamma here, and then some corresponding Langevin noise. Okay, so that would be the classical version of the system. What's the quantum version of the system? The quantum version of the system, I'm gonna work throughout this talk within the rotating wave approximation. So I'm gonna focus on this drive frequency, omega two being close to twice the natural resonance frequency of the system. So the Hamiltonian of the system now written in terms of A's and A daggers, the nonlinearity becomes this Hubbard-like term. The driving term, the interesting part of the drive is this kind of pairing term, right? Adding and removing photons or phonons two at a time. And this delta here represents a detuning of the drive. How far is omega two over two from the natural resonance frequency of the oscillator? Okay, we also need the, the dissipation terms. That's gonna come in the form of terms in a Lindblad master equation that I think we've seen in many talks already at this workshop. So in addition to the dynamics generated by the Hamiltonian, we have this Lindblad dissipation term that really just describes uh, you know, this kind of simple uh, single photon loss or damping. Okay, and it also describes the noise associated with that damping in the limit where it were at zero temperature. Okay, so this is already an interesting single mode driven dissipative system. It's non-trivial, this nonlinearity could be very, very large, the driving could be large. There's all sorts of interesting physics associated with the single mode problem, right? And in particular, this bifurcation physics you have classically, quantum mechanically, those two states you could imagine correspond to different coherent state amplitudes. There are regimes, versions of this problem where you can have uh, a whole manifold of dissipative steady states. So not only can you stabilize one of those two oscillation states, you can uh, stabilize superpositions of those, these Schrodinger cat states. This is of immense interest, for example, in the field of superconducting circuits. This is seen as maybe a really promising way to do quantum error correction, encode a logical qubit using these Schrodinger cat states. So that's a really interesting story. That is not the focus of this talk. The focus of this talk is, well, look, if one of these systems is interesting, surely life gets more interesting if we have an infinite number of them, right? So let's take this basic system and extend it to a lattice of cavities or oscillators. So now imagine having a many body system, right? So each of these little circles is an oscillator or a cavity mode. It has its own photon lowering operator. I have some very, very general form of this parametric driving, again, all in the rotating wave approximation. So it shows up as these bosonic pairing terms. In the way I'm, I'm writing things here, I don't have any ordinary single particle hopping. So all of the connectivity in this graph here is really corresponding to the different kind of pairing terms here. So if I see two sort of sites here connected by an edge, that means there's a term in the Hamiltonian that can add and remove pairs coherently from those two sites. Okay, so we have this really general form of pairing, a common detuning of all the modes. You can think of it as a chemical potential. And then maybe we have some general sort of two particle interactions, right? And again, this is a driven system. These are the drives. We can imagine balancing that by single photon loss on each of the modes. And the question is, okay, what happens with this kind of system, right? So the single mode case was interesting. When we have this multi-mode case, right, the kind of bifurcation physics that we had for a single mode, how does that turn into sort of some kind of phase transition, right? Do we have symmetry breaking? Can the steady state of this many body system have truly quantum features? And maybe more importantly and more greedily, can I say something about this system here without making any further approximations, without assuming, oh, I have lots of photons, I can do sort of semi-classics on this, I can do mean field theory. Is it possible to exactly solve a model like this? Okay, and what I'm gonna tell you is it is, right? With just one kind of assumption on the form of the interactions, there is a surprising way 
of getting an exact solution for the dissipative steady state of a model like this. Okay, I'm gonna really focus on this kind of model. The technique I'm gonna tell you about though, it's not a one hit wonder. It works for models that look very, very different than what I'm describing here. And hopefully at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about this Ising model where the similar techniques kind of work. Okay, so how are we gonna approach this? Let's go back to what I mentioned. Yeah, push and do. So there's different ways of answering that. So the first thing is um, it's easier to solve if I don't have the hopping terms, right? So that's, that's not a great answer, okay? The fuller answer is I can add certain hopping terms to the Hamiltonian, right? That will still keep the solution. So if I added single particle hopping, there are constraints on the hopping to still have the solution, right? You could also imagine, and again, I'll show you even a sketch of a way of realizing this experimentally. You can imagine a situation where all of the modes start out, all of these cavities have very, very different frequencies. So even if there were, let's say capacitive couplings, you couldn't have hoppings. You're modulating though the couplings between them. And that then sort of, you know, in a driven way sort of activates these processes. Yeah, okay, so there's a physics reason and the, this is what I can do as a theorist reason. Yeah, and please stop me if there are questions, it makes things uh, more fun. Okay, so how are we gonna to try to get an exact solution? Complete detour. We're gonna do a lightning uh, review of time reversal symmetry and detailed balance, because that is the way we wanna to try to get solutions here. Okay, a little bit of a delay, there we go. Okay, so time reversal symmetry. We know how to think about time reversal symmetry classically. If I solve some equations of motion, I play the movie backwards, that's still a solution, check mark. That's time reversal symmetry. We know how to think about it in closed quantum systems, right? If I have a Hamiltonian associated with uh, time reversal symmetry as some anti-unitary operator that leaves H invariant. For a dissipative system, even classically, we need a different notion, right? Just even classically playing the movie backwards, if I have damping, I can tell forwards from backwards evolution, right? So a useful way of thinking about consequences of time reversal symmetry, microscopic time reversal symmetry in the open system, even just classically, is the notion of detailed balance. Okay, so let's leave quantum master equations aside. Let's just think about a classical master equation. So for concreteness, think about a classical particle that's incoherently moving between these different states. I have probabilities that the particle is on any one of those sites, P sub J, and the evolution of those probabilities follows this kind of set of rate equations or master equations. So I have transition rates from one particular state to another. What does it mean to have detailed balance? If you solve for the steady state of this equation, right? And you get these steady state probabilities to be in different sites. then having detailed balance means if I take any pair of sites, the probability flux from I to J and J to I completely cancel. Okay, so there's a pairwise cancellation of these fluxes for any pair of states. That's the kind of standard formulation of uh, detailed balance we'll see in the back of a stat textbook. Another consequence of this is in that steady state, if you look at how observable quantities fluctuate, you also find that those correlation functions, those fluctuations obey a kind of onsog or time symmetry, right? So if I'm looking at the correlations of the fluctuations in some quantity A and B, it doesn't really matter which of those quantities I look at first. Okay, so that's all classical quantum, uh, you know, uh, detailed, uh, classical detailed balance. Simple point about classical detailed balance, if you have it, it makes it easier to solve for the steady state, right? So imagine I don't just have three sites, I have 10 million sites. In principle, I still have this master equation classically to get the steady state. You could just find the, you know, the, the null vector of that uh, rate matrix. That could be a pain. If you have detailed balance, you don't need to do that, right? If you have detailed balance, you can just use this condition that the probability fluxes vanish pairwise. You can just sort of build up the steady state probability distribution in a really, really easy way directly from the rates. Okay, so classically, if you have detailed balance, right? You can even just guess. Let's see if we have detailed balance there's a really easy way to construct the steady state. 
So the dream would be, can we do something similar in the quantum case? So in the quantum case, we go back not to an equation like this, but our general Lindblad master equation, right? And I really wanna work in a regime where I can't make some approximation to reduce this equation to a classical master equation. Okay, so I'm gonna be in a regime where in a sense there's some tension between the Hamiltonian and these dissipators. So the question is, is there a notion of quantum detailed balance for this full uh, Lindblad master equation? And does that notion of quantum detailed balance actually give me an easy way of finding a solution? Okay, so this is a, a huge area of activity. Um, there's a long history in the mathematical physics community of studying different notions of quantum detailed balance. Everyone and their brother has the definition of quantum detailed balance. A definition cannot be wrong, right? It might not be very useful. More recently in the condensed matter community, there's been a lot of interest in how do you meaning, meaningfully identify a notion of time reversal or an anti-unitary symmetry of a Lindblad master equation. So there's this huge mess of sort of definitions already out there. I'm gonna give you another one that is gonna be even weirder sounding than probably any of the others that you've seen. Bear with me, this definition actually has operational utility. So this definition, if the system has time reversal in the way I'm gonna define it, there's now a really direct way of getting exact insights into the steady state. Okay, so what is my definition? Here is my generic Lindblad master equation, right? Some system could have many degrees of freedom, driving and dissipation. The question is, is some anti-unitary operator T a symmetry of this dynamics? Okay, so what am I gonna do? So imagine I found the steady state of this Lindblad master equation, and I diagonalize that dissipative steady state. So here's this diagonalized form. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a purification of that steady state. Okay, so let's consider a doubled system, right, constructed in this pure state. So here's my original system. I'm calling it A. Here is this fictitious system B. If I trace out system B, I just recover this steady state. System B, right, for every pointer state N in my original steady state, I have N with this time reversal operator applied. And again, the question is, I'm trying to ask, is T a symmetry of my system? Okay, so I take the steady state, I take this candidate time reversal operator, I construct um, this thermofield double state. Then what do I do next? I actually consider dynamics of this doubled system. Okay, so here is the doubled system. A is the actual system. It has driving dissipation is a Hamiltonian. B has no dynamics whatsoever. So B is the other half of this thermofield double state. Okay, it's just some passive system. It's not doing anything. So what do I do? I imagine starting this doubled system in this correlated state. And I basically evolve the system just under the Lindblad master equation for system A. So system B has no dynamic, system A is evolving, right? System B in a way is remembering the initial condition of, of system A. And so now here is the test to see if we've actually identified a time reversal symmetry. So now I ask if I have this kind of Onsager symmetry for any pair of observables. Okay, so the idea is, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly, so exactly the same Hilbert space, it's just a copy, yeah. So the definition now of, uh, or the, the test, is T a symmetry of the system? Any correlation function like this, right, has to have this time symmetry. So I take two observables, X and Y, I could measure X on the evolving real system at time T, measure Y on this passive second system, you know, at t equals zero, or I could do it the other way around, I should always get the same answer. Okay, so we're using this idea that classically detailed balance, it's connected to Onsager time symmetry. We're enforcing now that in the, at the quantum level, but in a very kind of peculiar way, right? We go through the step of doubling the degrees of freedom, we introduce an entangled state, but the definition is now, if this is true, then aha, this T represents a symmetry of your system. 
Okay, so on this next slide, this is again just recapping. Yeah, question? Get everything here. So you're starting at t equals zero. That's right. And then the time evolution here is just due to the Limblodian that's on system A. There's no dynamics on system B. Yeah, got it. So this expectation value knows about your choice of T through this initial state. So when you say the original system doesn't have time, you mean just the Hamiltonian or, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> that's a whole other story. You know, in the examples I give you, what does this T operator actually look like? Often it's very, very hard to get some physical intuition into what it is. You can actually, there's a whole other talk I could give you about the consequences of this time reversal symmetry, the fact that it can be broken as you change parameters. For this whole talk, this is just gonna be a tool to getting exact solutions. Uh, but in general, you know, what exactly is that for a particular system? Uh, often it's, it's, it's not intuitively obvious at all. Um, it's sort of like classical detailed balance though. If you're just looking for a solution, you can try to find a detailed balance solution without first doing some big rigmarole to prove that there's some notion of microscopic detailed balance. So the same thing is gonna be true here. We can just hope for the best use these ideas to try to find a solution. And hey, if we find a solution using these methods, we know there was this hidden time reversal operator T lurking behind the system. Okay, so here is just recapping the general kind of, uh, this is again a definition of quantum detailed balance, a definition of hidden time reversal symmetry. This is something that exists in the mathematical physics community. It's often called KMS detailed balance one of a whole zoo of different definitions. The thing that is exciting to us is that this more exotic version of detailed balance, it's directly connected to an efficient way of getting solutions for the steady state. System. And that's what I'm gonna focus on here. I should also point out there's definitions of detailed balance in the quantum case that are maybe much more familiar that go back to the 70s work in quantum optics you basically enforce Onsager symmetry on all correlation functions. You don't go through this doubling of systems. That turns out to be a really, really restrictive condition. So that only applies for systems where the steady state commutes with the Hamiltonian. This weird definition can apply for much more complicated steady states. So steady states that do not commute with the Hamiltonian, systems where, again, there's a conflict between the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and what the dissipation wants to do. Okay, so how does this actually lead to um, exact solutions? So the idea is that it enables this, uh, this approach to getting exact solutions based on constructing perfect absorbers. Okay, so for concreteness, let's just consider our system being like a single oscillator, single cavity mode. Again, it's driven, there's some Lindblad master equation, there's some dissipation. Right? Theoretically, you can't stop me from modeling that dissipation as a coupling to a chiral waveguide, right? A channel where photons escape from the real system, go down this waveguide to never come back again. So why is that nice? I can put anything I want downstream, right? And that will not affect the physics of the colored system that I care about. Okay, so the kind of really neat uh, statement is, if you have this hidden time reversal symmetry, then there is a very si simple construction of what should you put downstream. You basically put a copy of the original system with minus the Hamiltonian. Okay, and then what happens, this auxiliary system, if you want, absorbs everything that's being emitted by this first system into this fictitious waveguide. So what does that mean at the end of the day? Again, you've taken like what looked like a bad problem and maybe made it worse, you've doubled the system. This doubled system will relax into a pure state. Okay, so if you have this pure state, you just trace out the fictitious system, you have the answer of the thing that you're after. It is even better than that. So we're no longer looking for uh, some general mixed state of a single system. We're looking for a pure state wave function. You might go, well, look, it's in some doubled space. 
It's even simpler than that. There are a lot of constraints involved in getting a pure state wave function. That constraint makes this thing, uh, in a lot of cases, fairly easy to find. Okay, and so just to give a flavor of what that actually turns out, if you want to get a pure state solution to this kind of doubled absorber network, and let's just really imagine we have two bosonic modes, right? The fictitious one has a lowering operator B, the real one has a lowering operator A. You need this, this correlated state to be dark with respect to the dissipation, right? So there's no net emission into the waveguide. That gives you one condition. You also need it to be a, a Hamiltonian eigenstate. And so when you put those two things together and you think about working with these, you know, these sort of composite modes, you really get a condition where you're looking for a single mode wave function. So it's no longer a doubled system problem. And it's really the zero mode of some, you can think of this as a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay, so it greatly reduces the complexity of the problem. And in many cases, this is a condition now that you can solve analytically. Okay, so that's the crux of the, of the method. And again, there's lots of details that are being left out here. If you wanna see the details, they're in this paper. Um, the upshot is this, micro, this notion of, detailed, of, of quantum detailed balance or hidden time reversal symmetry directly leads to this solution technique. Yeah, question. What is the effective uh, Hamiltonian here? What's that, sir? What is the effective Hamiltonian? So here? the effective Hamiltonian here is what you might call the no jump Hamiltonian coming from your Lindblad master equation. Yeah. Again, I'm happy to talk about details offline as well. Okay, so I have some, uh, I think I have like, you know, and this time is including questions, right? Okay, so I have like 10 minutes to do some physics now, right? So what can we learn? From these solutions. So let's try to jump into that. We've done some work using uh, these methods to get further insights into these single mode problems. There's some cool stuff that comes there. You can get photon blockade even when the nonlinearities are much weaker than um, the dissipation strength. Let me skip that. Let's go right to the, the many body problem. So here is that many body problem I kind of started the, the talk with. We have a network of bosonic modes, this very, very general set of parametric drives or pairing terms. The one simplification I'm gonna make is I'm gonna make the nonlinearity in my Hamiltonian, the interaction term, look like what we might call a charging energy term if we were talking about electrons, right? So this is a situation where there's an energy cost that's sort of quadratic in the total number of photons in the system. Okay, in sort of quantum optics language, the care nonlinearities and the cross care nonlinearities are all equal. Okay, so this is still a, a non-trivial problem, even with that change. And again, I'm going to balance the driving here with single photon loss on each of the modes. So this is the Lindblad master equation I'm trying to solve. Okay, and again, beyond this, no further approximations. The structure of this pairing array could be arbitrary. The size of the different terms here could be arbitrary. The number of sites could be arbitrary. Okay, and in general, what's the basic physics of this system? There's a competition between these pairing terms that just want to keep adding more and more and more correlated pairs into the system. That's balanced by this interaction term that tends to detune those processes, make them energetically unfavorable, and also the, the dissipation, right? That's sucking photons out of the system. Okay, so this is a system that we can solve exactly using this, this hidden time reversal approach that's described in this paper. Um, very, very briefly, this isn't completely science fiction. There's a number of different ways of realizing this global care interaction in superconducting circuits. If you have a bunch of non-interacting resonant modes that all hybridize with one single nonlinear object, for example, a single qubit, you can get something very, very close to this form of global interaction. Okay, so it's not just something that's a, a theoretical fiction. Okay, and then, yeah, let me just try to give you a, a little whirlwind glimpse of what is the kind of physics that comes out of this. And one of the things I wanna you know, emphasize is, okay, depending on your taste, sometimes the, the whole field of exact solutions or you know, integrable quantum systems, for some people, they leave a, a bad taste in your mouth because the solutions are very complicated. It's hard to not be an expert and immediately get something out of these solutions. With this method, the solution itself immediately 
gives you a wealth of physics. And so the thing I'll show you is I can write down in a half a slide what the exact solution is. And it gives us a really interesting way of thinking about the steady state. Uh, with a little bit of an abusive terminology, the steady state really corresponds to a condensate of pairs of photons, right? And I'll show you that in just a second. There's interesting quantum states that come out of this. So the possibility of many body pair coherent states. I talked about those cat states that people are excited about for quantum error correction. There's many body versions of that that can come out of this system if you tune the parameters correctly. And also really exciting, this is a system where you really do get something that looks like a first order phase transition as you make the system size larger. This exact solution lets you see how that phase transition emerges as you make the system size bigger and bigger. Okay, so nine minutes to give you a taste of some of that. So what's the form of the steady state, right? For this general model. So again, we want the steady state density matrix of our coupled lattice of modes. The exact solution gives us this purification. Right? So it gives us a pure state that describes a doubled system, the original lattice and this kind of fictitious shadow copy. So what is the form of this purification? It's a pair condensate. So let me call the real system lowering operators A sub J. B sub J corresponds to this fictitious copy. Okay, so now I can imagine even an odd combinations of real photon lowering operator, fake photon lowering operator. So to construct the steady state, I'm first gonna construct an operator that produces like a delocalized pair of photons in this plus mode. Okay, so it's a coherent sum of all of these different pair terms. And again, if you want the spatial structure of this pair is exactly determined by these pairing terms in the Hamiltonian. So then what does the steady state look like? Right? The steady state is just a coherent superposition of different numbers of pairs, right? And this coefficient in front, this thing that kind of determines the fugacity, there's a simple analytic expression for that. I think the slide got full, so oops, I didn't write all of that down. Right? So the coefficients here, the if you want the probability amplitude for having J of these pairs, that's just a function of the detuning, the dissipation, and the interaction step. Okay, so seemingly complicated system, relatively simple form for the final steady state. There's also a really nice group structure here. You can really think of this as a generator for a, a non-unitary representation of SU11. That makes it very, very easy to sort of use this form of the steady state to actually calculate observer. Okay, so the first physical insight that comes out of this, we can actually write down what the steady state is. There's a surprising uh, pair correlation structure. Let me even just skip this. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is, this is a function. I'm happy to write it down later. Yeah, so, this, so the ZJ is basically a function of this single dimensionless parameter that knows about interaction strength, right? The normalized interaction strength, the detuning and kappa. Everything appears with that one parameter. And the actual pair amplitudes only show up in determining the form of this pair creation operator. Okay, so one of the things I promised to tell you about was the emergence of phase transitions, right? So this is, uh, these are results for a kind of 2D lattice. Right, and again, the dimensionality here is we have a square lattice on every nearest neighbor bond. We have these pairing terms, right? That's defining the, the lattice geometry. We're tuning the, the chemical potential or the detuning and plotted in the log scale here is the average photon number, okay? And so we're looking at different sizes here, two by two, four by four, 10 by 10. For the smallest sizes you see as a function of detuning, you have sharp resonances, so discrete resonances associated with adding photons. As you make the system size bigger and bigger, these resonances start to coalesce. And for even a 10 by 10 system, you start to see something that really looks like a first order phase transition. And again, this is just coming from plotting the analytic solution. So it's a nice example of a system where 
you can really describe the emergence of what looks like a first order phase transition. You're doing this in a regime where I think brute force numerics would be challenging, if not impossible. This is also a regime where a purely semi-classical approach wouldn't work. The average photon number on each site is not huge, right? It's, it's order one or smaller. So there's still something quantum here at the level of what's happening at each individual site, right? Also on the topic of phase transitions, you could compare, what if you just did a kind of conventional Gertzfeller style mean field theory, right, for this problem, where you essentially assume the end site density matrix factorizes. So the results from mean field theory, that's these red curves here, right? The blue curves are coming from the exact solution. So the mean field theory, again, as a function of this detuning parameter or chemical potential, there's a regime where you have bistability, right? Mean field theory gives you more than one, um, you know, solution. The exact solution follows the mean field theory curves, but there's a sharp switching at a particular point, right? So that's something that, yes, in the large end limit, mean field theory is getting a lot of things right. That makes sense given the collective nature of the interactions. Getting this sharp transition point though, that's not something you can easily get from a, you know, a standard kind of mean field theory. All right, what's next here? Um, the solution lets you describe uh, spatial correlations, right? And there's a sort of a high density phase, a low density phase. If you look at density, density correlations and the photon density for different distances, those two different phases have a different sign of those correlations. There's bunching and anti-bunching. That turns out to be a really nice way of distinguishing different phases, right? So with these, uh, these dissipative phase transitions, it's often interesting to look at the strength of dissipation almost as playing the role of temperature, right? So as opposed to having a critical temperature, you have a critical dissipation strength, right? So that's kappa here. So the color scale here is photon density. The x-axis is always is detuning. So for low dissipation, you know, you have a kind of clear singularity from high density to low density. For higher values of dissipation, that kind of goes away. So again, the exact solution lets you identify what's the value of that critical dissipation strength. And again, the correlation functions, like these density-density correlation functions, also give you a nice way of distinguishing these two phases. Okay, I have two minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to partition that time by spending 45 seconds of telling you about a dissipative Ising model and then leaving time for questions. So let's just skip this. Okay, so this technique is neat. You might think, well, look, this is a one hit wonder, right? It only works for bosons with pairing. That is not the case. So this is work that David is just finishing writing up now. This same technique can be used to describe spin models. Okay, so here's a driven dissipative uh, transverse field Ising model really inspired by uh, an experiment with trapped ions that realized this kind of model. So you have long range Ising interactions, ZZ. You have drives on each of the qubits, Rabi drives, that in the rotating frame, there's some detuning, there's a drive amplitude on each qubit. And then all of that is balanced in our master equation by some T1 decay, some relaxation of the qubits and the Z bases. Okay, so this turns out to be exactly solvable using these same methods. Key point, this is not a completely collective model. So the exact solution works even if these Rabi drives, omega j, vary from spin to spin to spin. So this is not ex uh, an example of uh, an LMG style model where you can write everything in terms of collective spin operators. It makes life easy. This is a model that doesn't conserve total angular momentum. It's a model that doesn't have permutation symmetry. It's still solvable with these techniques. Okay, and then the last slide and then 30 seconds for questions. Oops, there is a slide with some results, All right? So for this model, again, um, these are some results just showing the emergence of phase transition physics in this now driven spin model. The y-axis is the, the density of excitations, right, of the qubits. X-axis is detuning. And again, you see something similar to that bosonic model. For small systems, you have discrete resonances. As system size increases, those merge together to give you what looks like a first order transition. And this red region is where, if you did mean field theory, you would get multiple solutions, right? You would not identify this sharp transition point. Okay, now I promise I will actually stop. 
let me put my conclusions up. Hopefully I've given you uh, maybe an impressionistic flavor of some of these ideas uh, and a sense that, look, it really can be a useful technique to get insight into uh, a bunch of interesting models. With that, I will stop. Thank you. Quick. So questions, yeah. <laughs> you have the mic. <laughs> Is there any uh, PT symmetry breaking going on at this transition? So, you know, you can, you can see there's a little, uh, in terms of open questions, everything we've done with these techniques so far have really just focused on understanding the steady state. So we have not looked at, again, there's different ways you could think about PT symmetry in a full Lindblad system. You might want to know something about the, the spectrum of your Liouvillean. We haven't really investigated with any seriousness whether these techniques tell us something or put constraints on the spectrum. We believe that has to be the case because this hidden time reversal symmetry constrains time dependent correlation functions that goes beyond just the steady state. But actually going further with that idea is still something we want to look at. I was curious about the exact solution you find and if you tried to find any connection to Gaudin integrability with central spin models, it seems very connected. Yeah, so the, uh, the SU11 structure, um, we tried at one point to think whether these exact solutions could be viewed as a, as a non-Hermitian version of those Gaudin models and we did not find a direct connection there. So the Gaudin models, like the bosonic versions, they're always particle number conserving. Our models at the Hamiltonian level, we have these explicit pairing terms. So we thought maybe with some clever displacement, we could connect them. There's something spiritually connected, right? But we couldn't make a concrete connection. Sorry, I just uh, put yeah, yeah. out, uh, but you, it's probably not connected because you don't have beta equations. Yeah, yeah. So the way we're doing the solution here does not involve like solving set of yeah. equations. There's no real constraints on the coupling for instance. Uh, a Gaudin, you said. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The Gaudin models also require pretty structured interaction constants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, question regarding the missing model finding. So. <clears throat> Is it clear what's the connection between the structure of the dissipator and whether you have this uh, hidden symmetry? For instance, if I had, uh, let's say, uh, not all of them decaying independently, if I have some correlated dissipation, would I still have this symmetry? Yeah, it's a great question, and I wish I had a better answer. Like, I don't think we really have intuition in terms of if you just give me a model, can I stare at it and go, oh, yeah, this is going to work? So there are some very, very weird terms. We focused on this more in the, in the bosonic case. There are some very innocuous looking terms. You might think, oh, this is not that complicated. Let me add it. It completely ruins this solution. Right? There are other really weird terms you can add, weird nonlinear hopping terms. Those preserve it. So um, I think this is something that we need to sort of understand better, right? And it does tell you, we use the word hidden time reversal symmetry, maybe non-obvious time reversal symmetry. Um, we don't have a great intuition for when this symmetry holds and when it doesn't. I think Prashnendu asked about adding hopping terms. That's a great example. You would think that, come on, how bad could that be? Well, in most cases, it ruins the solvability, right? There's certain hopping terms you can add in that bosonic model, it still works. Most hopping terms will not work. Um, okay, so let's, uh, and I don't have the slides here for that. That's something that we looked at in a, let me go back to the bosonic model. Um, so if, I, if you allow me the luxury of looking at the n equals one model, right? If I just have one site, you could also ask that question, right? In the limit where the interactions are very, very, very weak, Time reversal is almost what you might expect it to be for, for bosons. So in phase space, x goes to x, uh, p goes to minus p, right? So in the limit of weak interactions, 
time reversal symmetry looks like a kind of phase space reflection. As the interactions get bigger and bigger, we can, we can write down and like numerically study the form of that, time, of that T operator, but it doesn't have, it's some non-Gaussian deformation of this phase space reflection operation. Right? And so that's, that's also something we'd like to understand better, right? Uh, you know, I should say that even though it seems exotic, um, and maybe just one important point, right? You can actually test whether you have this symmetry in an experiment, right? So I phrased the symmetry in terms of these correlation functions that seem to involve having a doubled system, and that's a hard thing to do in an experiment. If you only have access to the original system, there's a subset of correlation functions just involving system A that still have this Onsager symmetry. So there's a very, very concrete thing you could measure in a real system to see whether this symmetry exists or not. Um, just very quickly. Um, so typically with this SU11 thing, you know, the steady states are two different kinds, the heating and the non-heating phases, as they say. Is there any relation of this transition between a transition from a heating to a non-heating phase in the SU11 boson language? So, so which SU11, are you thinking about a Gaudin type model or are you thinking about something else? So uh, I'm not exactly sure, but um, if you take this SU11 generators, yep. they are states of this, you know, the, the non-heating phase and the heating phases, where it's just the Casimir of the group which changes sign. So just wondering if the transition that you see has anything to do with uh, that kind of, uh, you know, Transition between. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, yeah, I know. Oh, well, the, yeah, we yeah, yeah. We should chat later. Yeah. I think of SU11 is just a very nice way of thinking about multimode parametric amplifier physics, right? Yeah. There are no more questions. Let's thank the speaker once again. And